Good morning and welcome, everyone. We continue with our opening verses. O oh Lord, I give my life to you. I trust in you, my God. Do not let me be disgraced or let my enemies rejoice in my defeat. No one who trusts in you will ever be disgraced, but disgrace comes to those who try to deceive others. Show me the right path, O Lord. Point out the road for me to follow. Lead me by your truth and teach me, for you are the God who saves me. All day long I put my hope in you. The Lord is a friend to those who fear him. He teaches them his covenant. May integrity and honesty protect me, for I put my hope in you. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let us pray. O Lord, by your bountiful goodness, release us from the bonds of our sins, which by reason of our wickedness we have brought upon ourselves, that we may stand firm until the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Be seated, please. Good morning. Our first reading is from the 12th chapter of Daniel. At that time, Michael the archangel, who stands guard over your nation, will arise. Then there will be a time of anguish greater than any since the nations first came into existence. But at that time, every one of your people whose name is written in the book will be rescued. Many of those whose bodies lie dead and buried will rise up, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting disgrace. Those who are wise will shine as bright as the sky, and those who lead many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever. This is the word of the Lord. Our second reading comes to us from Hebrews chapter 10. Under the old covenant, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, which can never take away sins. But our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all the time. Then he sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand, there he waits until his enemies are humbled and made a footstool under his feet. For by that one offering, he forever made perfect those who are being made holy. And the Holy Spirit also testifies that this is so. For he says, this is a new covenant I will make with my people on that day, says the Lord, will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. Then he says, I will never again remember their sins and lawless deeds. And when sins have been forgiven, there is no need to offer any more sacrifices. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty conscience have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Let us hold tightly without wavering in the hope that we are firm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together so, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. This is the word of the Lord. Let us all please rise. <laughs> the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. As Jesus was leaving the temple that day, one of his disciples said, Teacher, look at these magnificent buildings. Look at the impressive stones and the walls. Jesus replied, Yes, look at these great buildings. 
but they will be completely demolished. Not one stone will be left on top of another. Later, Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives across the valley from the temple. Peter, James, John, and Andrew came to him privately and asked him, Tell us, when will all this happen? What sign will show us that these things are about to be fulfilled? Jesus replied, Don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name claiming, I am the Messiah. They will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in many parts of the world, as well as famines. But this is only the first of the birth pains with more to come. When these things begin to happen, watch out. You will be handed over to the local councils and beaten in the synagogues. You will stand trial before governors and kings because you are my followers. But this will be your opportunity to tell them about me. For the good news must first be preached to all nations. But when you are arrested and stand trial, don't worry in advance about what to say. Just say what God tells you at that time. For it is not you who will be speaking, but the Holy Spirit. A brother will betray his brother to death, a father will betray his own child, and children will, will rebel against their parents and cause them to be killed. And everyone will hate you because you are my followers. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Be seated, please, and I invite the children to come forward. You good there? All right. How's everybody doing today? Good? You did a wonderful job singing How Great Thou Art. You did. You're looking at me like, what? Oh, it is one of my favorites. Yes, it is. It is. Uh, it's one of them that's, that's in our hymnal. Uh, I was your guys' age when I uh, first was introduced to that song, 
And, um, you know, there's a good message in that song. When we say how great thou art, we're talking about... We're talking about how great God is, absolutely. How great Jesus is and what he has done for us. And it talks about a couple of things in there. One is that we can just look at all of creation and how magnificent and how huge it is, how beautiful it is. And it gives us an impression about how great our God is. But one of the ways that we really know God's love for us, you guys did a motion in there, in the song, right? And what, what's that about? It's yeah. the cross that Jesus died on for our sins. It's the cross that Jesus died on for our sins. There is how we know God's great love for us. See, that's a good message for us to use to encourage one another. That we have a great and powerful God, but we also have a God that loves us tremendously, who is with us every day. Now, do you guys encourage each other every day? Hmm. No? You, you mean you're not encouraging to your sister all the time? No. No. I'm never encouraging you. random names. She calls you random names. I figured I could safely, I figured I could safely pick on you two and get a good resa- response. So thank you. I appreciate that. You see, sometimes we are not as encouraging as maybe we could be. And that is the truth. Yes. God comes to us and encourages us when we're having a difficult time in his word, but especially with his people, with music, and we give people a pat on the back, and we tell them thank you for things that they have done and that we appreciate it. Right? It's good for us to reflect upon that, because we can always grow in encouraging one another. Let's fold our hands, let's bow our heads. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this song that has been written and these children in singing it. Help us, Lord, to be people of encouragement, to share your word of who you are, what you've done for us, Help us, Lord, to be thankful for the many blessings that you've brought our way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the discipleship concept that we're going to cover today is encouragement. I would like to begin by having you think about someone who has made a positive impact upon your life. So just think of who that person is, first of all. Then, did they do something or say something that was really important to you, that was encouraging or motivating? And what was it that they did? And what was it that they said to you? Now, I imagine you probably had something immediately come to mind. Maybe it was an event where, or a time where they noticed something good in you. There was some potential, there was some ability that they felt could be great with some development. And you appreciated the fact that they took notice of you. What they noticed, it got your attention. And maybe it even led you to look at yourself differently and it gave a direction for you in your life. Maybe they noticed some particular trouble that you were facing. There was some circumstance in your life that was difficult and they took the time to listen to your problem. 
And they responded with some words of forgiveness and hope. And the idea was for you to be able to experience some better days in the future. This focus of forgiveness to be able to put the past behind and hope for a better future. You appreciated their care and their concern as you experienced this time of difficulty. Maybe they noticed that you were struggling with something and they offered to teach you or to help you with whatever it was. They took the time to share some of their skill, their expertise, some of their experience in life. They put it into practice and you benefited from it. Often, encouragement and personal growth are connected. When you go through a time of difficulty and somebody comes along and encourages you, it leads to personal growth on your own part. This concept of encouragement is very frequent in the Bible. If you read through, you're going to find encouragement all over the place. Now, you might say, well, I don't know. I've, I've read the Bible. It doesn't seem real encouraging. But let me just provide for you a little bit of information here. The word encourage uh, is used 92 times in the Bible. The word encouragement is used another 17 times. And the word courage is used 50 times. That's a fair bit. But in addition to that, there's a variety of other ways that the similar concept is communicated in God's Word as people are supported, helped, taught, trained, raised up, equipped, and other similar type of things. Now, each one of those is a little different. There's a little nuance to each one, but you have this idea of encouragement and building people up at the name of Jesus, at his direction, so that there is a positive impact on a person's life. Now, one of those places in the Bible is in our uh, second reading today from Hebrews uh, chapter 10. In that reading, you heard several key words, confidence, assurance, and hope. And in that reading, it tells us that it is the life of Jesus, what he did for you, what he continues to do for you that provides a foundation for you to have confidence, assurance, and hope. He's the one that forgives your sins, and he is the one that gives new life and new opportunities. And he encourages you in your journey in life. This is central to Christian discipleship. Now, the writer of the letter to the Hebrews makes the point that this is the foundation for thinking of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works and to encourage one another. Now, I would like to address what I think is a common misunderstanding about encouragement in our world today. At least this is just my perspective of what I have observed, witnessed, and seen. Sometimes people think that encouragement can only be positive. That, that might sound like an odd statement, so just hear me out here. For some people, if you mention anything negative, they interpret that as being discouraging. If you express an opinion that disagrees with them, then they also view that as discouraging. So, it has to be all positive all the time, and you must always agree and support their opinion. That's not exactly a biblical concept of encouraging. That is simply setting oneself up to make sure that your viewpoint is supported. Part of the biblical concept of encouragement is to have the courage to discuss problems and struggles and difficulties in a person's life. Encouragement doesn't avoid the problems by focusing only on good things. Now, you're supposed to focus on the good things, that's true, but you don't just simply avoid the problems. 
there are some very difficult topics and issues that people face in life. And it's just reality. So what are some ways that as we face these challenges, we can encourage each other? First one is encouragement can be how you listen, how you listen to somebody. It can be very encouraging to know that somebody is willing to take the time to listen as you express your concerns and your point of view. You don't necessarily have to agree with what they are saying, but it can be encouraging to know that somebody's willing to take the time to listen. It shows care and compassion just simply listening to them. In addition, think about it this way. How can somebody possibly respond in any meaningful way if they haven't listened to what you have to say? In addition to that, one of the things that we like about God, at least I do, is that he promises to listen to us always. He will always have a listening ear ready to hear us. Likewise, he wants us to listen to one another. Christ listens to us. He hears our prayers. We depend upon that. He calls us to encourage others by listening to them. Second, encouragement can be about finding something good that a person is doing. I think most people are going to agree with that one. It is encouraging to find something that somebody is doing that is good. Maybe it's noticing some raw talent that can be developed. I think it's important for us to remember this. The Lord has gifted everyone. Everyone has been gifted. Now, these gifts are different. Different people have different abilities. It's good for us to recognize those differences. We don't all need to be the same. God didn't make us to be that. He wants us to use those gifts that he's given to us in a variety of ways. We have those different talents and abilities so that we can come together and be able to do things better as they complement one another. So as you look at people around you, your spouse, your children, family, neighbors, whomever. What do you notice? What is the talent that someone has? Take the time to tell them what they're doing that is good. Number three, sometimes encouragement has a lot to do with attitude. People make mistakes. And when they make mistakes, they can feel like a failure. I have to admit, a failing that I had this morning. You notice our setup here is a little different than what it normally is when the children sing. We usually have some platforms up here and a mic in the middle so that you guys can be able to hear them better. Guess who forgot to put it out? That would be me. Guess when I realized it? When they were walking up. I'm sorry. These things happen in life. Sometimes they can be big things, sometimes they're not so big. But a reminder of forgiveness can be very important in life. A reminder that their effort is appreciated can be encouraging as people put forward a good effort. A reminder that God is not done with them yet can pick them up. That can be an important thing, especially when somebody is struggling that God is not done with them in their life. A reminder that we stand together and that we are people that support one another. This is important as Christian disciples. These kind of statements show understanding, they show appreciation, and finally, they show hope. Always hope. 
A lot of about encouragement has to do with what you say. Are your words compassionate? Are you speaking with kindness? Is it courteous? Is it truthful? Is it hopeful? Is it comforting? Are you building others up? And I think here's a key thing. Is the almighty and gracious God in your response? Is it filled with the love of God in Jesus Christ? Is there a focus upon Jesus being greater than any trouble that we face? That he has the ability to be able to conquer whatever it is and be able to work through you in his kingdom. Encouragement is a part of the mission, vision, and core values at St. Mark. If you happen to have one of the inserts with they'll know we are Christians by our love, on the back side of it is printed our mission, vision, and core values. I had it printed on the back of that for this very reason. It was just in early October that we adopted this uh, for our congregation. And um, so this is now the uh, distribution or beginning of the distribution of this information. Um, so this is the, uh, we're getting this information out to everybody. I want you to notice the St. Mark vision statement. It says, we are a courageous church, faithfully responding to our community with love, care, and grace. Now, I mentioned two weeks ago about St. Mark for many years. It was the St. Mark Lions. It had to do with the school being the Lions. And a lion is known for courage. Absolutely, courage. It's an important thing. It's a symbol of courage. I now want you to take a look at the leadership line. Under the core values, uh, third one down, we seek to empower our members in their skills by encouraging them to serve in the church and the community with their gifts. Empower in their skills by encouraging them to serve in the church and in the community with their gifts. Courage and encourage are obviously related. I mean, they're just, uh, they're similar words. How are they related? Encouragement builds courage. Hmm. Encouragement builds courage. How is it that we develop courage to do things? We need to know or be reminded that we're good at something that this is an important thing. That helps us to have that encouragement, helps us to have the courage to continue to do that, or maybe even to start something that you haven't done before. This is part of how we build one another up. It's important for us as disciples to be people who encourage one another. Now, this doesn't mean it's going to be all positive all the time. That's just a reality. Yet, even in the difficulties, troubles, and challenges, there is encouragement and hope. You see, we have a God of hope. Now, I would like to point out that even during grim situations in the Bible, there are consequences for sin and violating God's law, but still the Lord provides words of hope and encouragement. When I mentioned earlier about encouragement is throughout the Bible, uh, you may have had the thought come to mind, well, I've read some of those Old Testament stories. I don't see much encouragement in some of those. And you're probably right. There isn't a lot. Because a lot of that had to do with writing down what was the situation, what was the consequences for the sin, but I would like to encourage you to do this. As you read such stories, find the words of hope that God provides. You see, there's concepts in the Old Testament such as the Lord will save a remnant. What does that mean? There's always going to be a core group. 
a faithful group that God is going to save, that is going to be redeemed, that's going to be brought out so that God's kingdom will continue. The remnant, that's the faithful, those that God continues to work in and through. There's things like the Lord will send a savior, the Lord will send a redeemer, one who is going to forgive their sins and bring them new life. They'll even have just little phrases like the son of man. And you see that in the Old Testament. It's like, well, what in the world's that? You don't really find out that until you get to the New Testament and the gospel and you find that Jesus is that son of man, the prince of peace. There's all of these titles that Jesus fulfills. He is the one who came to be victorious over sin, victorious over death and the devil. And he promises to go with us wherever we go. He is powerful and he will defeat evil. He strengthens us with the Holy Spirit so that we have the courage to battle the problems that we face. So we are people of encouragement. The Lord calls us to walk with one another in this Christian faith. He calls us to build each other up. He calls us to support each other. Now, this isn't to be done blindly. This is to be done thoughtfully with love, care, compassion, grace, understanding, and always with hope. Why do we have to end with that hope? That's very, very important. There's always hope for us to have a better future in Christ. We are people of love and of faith and of hope. God working in and through us, encouraging us and leading us to encourage one another. In Jesus' name, amen. Now may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, keep our hearts in our minds, in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us rise and we'll confess our faith together in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate, he suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life for the world to come. Amen. Be seated, please. And Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean, we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. 
As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for all of the blessings that you bring our way each day. As we enter into this week of thanksgiving, lead us and help us to be mindful of those blessings and to take some time to express thanks for those blessings, to express those thanksgivings, not only to you, but to one another. Grant that we may, with thankful hearts, receive these great mercies and express our gratitude, not only with our lips, but also in our lives, as we give ourselves to your service and walk before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Deliver us from sin and error, from the frailties of the flesh, the allurements of this present age, and the temptations of the devil. Give us faith that works in love, hope that never disappoints, kindness that never fails, confidence in you that never wavers, patience that does not grow weary, and courage always ready to confess Christ, that we may live in your mercy and die in your peace. We pray this and whatever else we have in our hearts this day as we pray together the prayer the Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endures forever. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.